So I think we are on. Right. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's colloquium. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this afternoon, Professor Russell Witt. Uh, he's a native Tucsonian. He actually got his bachelor's degree in physics from the University of Arizona, and then he moved on to ASU to get his uh, PhD in bioengineering. After that, he had a uh, postdoc stint at the University of uh, Michigan in Harbor in developing no novel imaging contrast mechanisms. And uh, in, in 2007, he moved back to Tucson, and he's currently an associate professor of medical imaging in optical sciences and biomedical engineering here. And his research activities are focused on exploiting advantages of ultrasound imaging uh, while overcoming its limitations, especially poor contrast and soft tissue. And by combining different forms of energy, for example, light, sound, electricity, and so on, his lab exploits special effects specifically for acoustic, thermoacoustic, um, uh, acoustic uh, electric mechanisms to non-invasively image optical and microwave absorption and deep tissue. Uh, and today he'll be talking about on the outside looking in, shaking up medical imaging with light, sound, and electricity. So with that, I'd like to welcome our speaker. Okay, thank you. And even though I uh, got my PhD at ASU, I'm, I'm still a Wildcat fan. That, <laughs> that never changed. Just wanted to clear that up. There was no real bioengineering department at that time, so. That, that's my excuse, I guess. Okay. So if we, kind of, if we look outwards, whether it's through a microscope or into the sky, I mean, we can go here. I've got 21 orders of magnitude of the kind of things that we can look at, and, and that's certainly not the limit. Um, but when we try to look a few millimeters into the body, that's still pretty challenging. In fact, you know, other than x-rays a long time ago, we only really recently have been able to make images like these, and they're supposed to all be kind of showing the same thing. At least it's the same structures. This is just a pig skeletal muscle, and there's an electrical electrode stimulator implanted. The ultrasound, that's pretty ridiculous. You can't really see much there. And the CT and MRI are obviously showing you different information. So th these are really the tools that we have available, along with the nuclear medicine. Harry Barrett's here, and I probably if, if they had taken an image with SPECT or something, or uh, uh, so one, of, one of his techniques, maybe we could compare. But uh, the same situation, You're, you would see a completely different type of image. And one of the big problems, of course, is the, the dif optical diffraction limit usually prevents you from traveling much more than a millimeter into scattering tissue. And so all the optical techniques, although they can give you great resolution, are li limited to about a millimeter with few exceptions. And the other imaging techniques, ultrasound, MR, CT, for example, um, have great penetration, but the resolution jumps way up. So that's kind of the challenge, at least in terms of resolution. There's the other challenge in terms of contrast, what exactly you're looking at. So uh, ultrasound is attractive for quite a few reasons, because uh, it's, it's scalable and it's translational. Um, you can penetrate very good temporal resolution. You can do real-time, even volumetric imaging, although it's usually a 2D, so you're looking at cross-sections in real-time. Um, but one of the big problems is you've got poor contrast in soft tissue because the speed of sound is very similar on the different types of soft tissue. And so that's kind of where my, my lab fits in, and that's trying to take advantages of sound and ultrasound for imaging, but looking for new ways to get contrast out of those. And going beyond that one millimeter or one centimeter uh, limit in terms of, uh, of depth of penetration at looking at materials or tissue. And so here I put up four kind of examples of things that you could look at with ultrasound. We can look at tissue elasticity. I'm going to show a few slides on what that is and how it works and what we can see with those techniques. Um, looking at optical or microwave absorption with ultrasound. Um, looking at electrical current with ultrasound. And th the last one is kind of the newest thing I'm working on in, in, with a professor in the math department, Leonid Kunyansky, is uh, adding a magnetic field and doing what's called magnetoacoustoelectric imaging, which is related to the conductivity of the sample, at least the source of the contrast but I won't talk any more about that one. Um, 
We also develop complementary imaging tools. So uh, if you're into the nanotechnology or um, these types of contrast agents, or in some cases even uh, drug therapy, I'm showing a vast range going from a fluorescent dye to a micro bubble, so going from nanometer to micron scale and everything in between, we can use these structures as contrast agents with the modalities that I mentioned on the previous slide. And uh, I've also been involved in developing acoustic sensors, including with collaborators here in optical sciences, especially the top left one. Um, but these can be uh, these can be used to rapidly detect sound in an array-based system, rather than using piezoelectric kind of receivers, which are typically used for uh, ultrasound detection and, and transmission. Um, and, the, and these are some of the fancy toys. It may look a little bit messy, but um, these are some things that we have had or had in the lab in the past. Microwave transmitters, um, electronics, tunable pulse lasers, ultrasound systems. Um, so if you're a student and you're, you're interested in a rotation or um, some of the things I talk about are, sound interesting, um, definitely contact me. Um, mainly what I'm looking for is students that are curious. So if you, uh, don't, don't, if you question or don't believe half of the things I'm talking about, that's probably a good thing. And if you're faculty here, I'm always also looking for collaborators because some of these projects kind of stall or die because I don't really have uh, a great um, contact with collaboration here to continue the project. So um, if some of these things are in your area and you think you can contribute, also please uh, contact me. So to get started, and I'm kind of keeping track here with this, this green. Oh, I can't see this. Can get my laser pointer. So the, the first one is shaking things up with sound itself. So one of the uh, really most recent things to come out uh, of ultrasound imaging, even now in the clinical systems, is this shear wave imaging, shear wave. And this is simply the concept. You hit it with a, a long push pulse with the ultrasound, and this creates shear waves that propagate perpendicular to this longitudinal beam. And then right after you push, you then have these tracking pulses that allow you to track the displacement and speed of these waves as they propagate. And it turns out the, the speed of that wave is directly related to the mechanical and elastic properties of the tissue. And this is kind of what the, the process looks like. You, you push, uh, you track with fast plane waves. You focus here, and then you have just plane waves coming down that might be 10 kilohertz kind of frame rates, which allows you to get these displacement maps. And then you can reconstruct the shear modulus from the displacement maps, calculate shear wave speed, and the square of the velocities related to the shear modulus. And density, of course, is also a term in there. So the first thing I wanted to do, because I don't trust the machines, you know, they give you Siemens just came out with a machine, and sometimes they're disorganized. You know, I, I, I can't believe necessarily what they show on the machine. So we set up a, a system where we have uh, three gels. Um, there's graphite in there to provide acoustic scattering. That's why it's dark. And there are different uh, stiffnesses because some are 5, 10, 15 percent uh, gelatin. So now we can see... Um, what they look like on the, in the Siemens machine that we recently got at the university. Uh, the B-mode grayscale ultrasound image, they all look kind of similar. Certainly nothing you could pull out that would tell you something mechanical. But as soon as you introduce the shear wave pulse, you can see here shear wave speed is in this color scale. Um, and you can clearly see a gradual increase in the stiffness as you go from the 5 to the 15%. And if you just compute an average and standard deviation, you get something that looks like that. And we also wanted to validate it. So there's a technique using a force balance, and we push gently on there, and we can get these stress-strain uh, curves and also estimate independently the stiffness of the gels. And when you compare the ultrasound shear wave that I showed on the previous slide with the direct method, they're, you know, they're all within one standard deviation. So uh, that gave us a little bit of confidence. We're also trying to bring in MRI into this because there is a, uh, an analogous technique with MRI imaging. Um, you don't use a push with the ultrasound usually. You have an external vibrator, and that allows you to track shear speed. Um, but with that gel, we didn't get good results, so they're still working on it. That means ultrasound 1, MRI 0. But um, uh, this time we're letting them make the phantom and get good images, and then we'll take the ultrasound back. 
Uh, so what can we do with this now that it seems to at least give us some useful information? Well, I just have a couple of examples. Um, this is simply just a, a human subject. I'm showing the gastrocnemius muscle and the soleus muscle, and right in between there's a tendinous structure, uh, aponeurosis structure. And when the calf muscle is relaxed, you can kind of see the shear wave velocity. When the calf muscle is contracted, you can see these, you know, not only does it get stiffer, but uh, the shear wave speed goes up, but also you see these little red dots, and those are the... Uh, medial heads of this aponeurosis, um, and they stiffen up when they get contracted. And this, when you ever, if, if you've ever pulled a calf muscle, it's right in here where you get that injury. You usually get a little fluid, and it pulls apart, and you uh, tear a calf. Uh, just one other example. This is a normal Achilles tendon. I, I'm, I'm interested in MSK, but there are uh, um, projects going on uh, related to thyroid, liver, you know, a prostate, uh, using this technique, and, and a lot of these things have been published, but I think there is a niche for MSK applications, um, so that's why I'm showing you those today. Uh, so when you have a contracted uh, Achilles tendon, it's get very stiff, and in fact, it's saturated. Um, this is an abnormal Achilles with something called tendinopathy. The person had discomfort, and it turns out there's like fluid right in here that's soft right in the middle of the Achilles tendon. You can see how much larger it is also. Um, so give it, getting the mechanical information tells you quite a bit about the path, um, pathophysiology. Okay, so now I'll switch. Now you have a kind of a general idea of how to use ultrasound to image mechanical properties. I'm going to change things a little bit. We're not going to do shear wave imaging, but we are still going to do ultrasound elasticity imaging. And we're going to look start at the feet. Actually, this talk is going to kind of progress from the foot to the top of the head. So by the end, I hope I've covered most of the body, which is kind of one of the goals. Okay, so, um, so this, is, uh, this is a posterior tibial tendon, common uh, overuse. In, uh, it's, uh, you often see overuse injuries in women over 40. This is a very common case. The orthopedic surgeons get patients like these all the time. Uh, it, it ultimately, leads to these flat foot deformities and, 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 and difficulty walking. Um, but how can we do elasticity imaging without shear waves? I'll get to that in the next slide. So just in terms of the clinical application of this, uh, when people come to the clinic with this tendinopathy, severe tendinopathy, the, the orthopedic surgeon has really no way to know whether uh, this bracing therapy, which can go on for many months, will help this person recover, or whether they really just need to go for surgery, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. So we're trying to come up with a uh, not just a diagnostic, but a prognostic tool to kind of predict the outcome um, before they actually do it using the ultrasound techniques. So that's the concept. So without shear waves, remember what we were using the shear waves for. It was to push and then track the displacement. Well, it turns out uh, if the person is, if, if the tendon and these structures are moving by themselves, we can do, take the same, look at the same tracking uh, that we, we, we do with the shear wave and measure strain in the tissue itself. So we can get tendon strain, skin, uh, malleolus, which is your ankle bone, and still get elastic um, properties from the tissue without using shear wave. Now, we are still interested in using shear wave for this uh, project. Uh, right now, uh, the clinical machines would not let you do real-time imaging while the person's doing a task, and in this case, they're doing an inversion task where they're pushing with their toe against the force transducer, which allows us to uh, not only track the displacement in the, and strain in the tendon, but also the actual force he's exerting, uh, which is primarily related to this tendon that we're interested in. And this is simply how we measure strain in this situation. We're measuring, this is the inversion force. Uh, this is the tendon displacing. And this is, I'm showing here displacement, so lateral displacement. We can do 2D tracking. Uh, of the speckles, and, uh, but we're mainly interested in the displacement and strain along the axis of the tendon itself. So since we have force and we have strain, we cannot say that we have an absolute um, Young's modulus or shear modulus, we, but we do have kind of a relative elastic modulus that we, that we use to compare uh, the, the patients and the volunteers that we've looked at so far. And, you know, I won't give you some of the population things, but this is just a, a quick view of what we've seen in the initial studies of maybe we've seen like tw uh, 10 volunteers and 10 patients, something on that order. This seems to be the pattern. So these are stress strain curves. Healthy 
uh, patients, healthy volunteers tend to have a pretty linear stress-strain relationship, but the patients seem to deform quickly with very little uh, stress attra attributed to the tendon, and then it can't strain anymore. So um, this is kind of like a rubber band, right? So it stretches, it's really stretchy rubber band, and once you get to the end, it can't do any more. Whereas this one is kind of a continuous stretch the rubber band, right? So that's the difference. So this is uh, what we call, it's really a nonlinear elastic property, and it's load-dependent elasticity, so we measure these slopes, and that's how we do the comparison. Okay, so, and, and so finally, just uh, a few months ago, we got a new NIH R21 to do this in a more organized way. Um, Basically, the outcome is supposed to tell us whether we could predict whether these patients go for surgery or got better through rehabilitation. So um, without going through the details there, that's essentially what we're going to try to look for. And all I showed here is there's a difference between healthy and patients, but what we really want to know is from the patients, can we predict which way they're going to go before they actually do it? Okay? So then, then we're going to go to the next technique. All right, so that's how you can use sound to push something, shake, shake things up with sound, and uh, get a very interesting contrast in the tissue, deep into tissue. Now, the next thing is we can shake things up with light or microwaves also, but same principle, but let's just stick to light right now. Um, this goes back to Alexander Graham Bell, who invented a photophone in 1880, and it used the thermoacoustic effect. And uh, there's a, a plaque in New York that commemorates the first conversation uh, on a wireless telephone in 1880. Um, and Alexander Graham Bell always considered that his greatest invention, certainly not the telephone. And uh, this, this quote here, if you read that, uh, gives you an idea of what he thought of this. But how did it work? Well, this is a chopper, so he's actually taking sunlight and chopping it into this device that had a black material. And as the sunlight... Uh, hit the black material, it, cr it created a click sound. So if this is modulated in the right way uh, to uh, generate conversation or talk, uh, the person would be able to have a conversation hundreds of yards away. Um, and it's the black material, it's the interaction with the sunlight and the black material that made that possible via the thermoacoustic effect. I wanted to mention one, a couple other things historical to see how these effects ultimately became, got involved into imaging techniques that we have today. The thermoacoustic effect um, was also discovered to be a um, source for microwave hearing. So uh, here, there's an entire book on this of how to use, mi not only how to use microwaves to uh, induce the perception of sound in, in someone's brain, uh, but they're also trying to figure out what the mechanisms were, because there were several possible mechanisms that were uh, uh, could explain what, what people were sensing. Um, and they basically concluded, and there are other books and lots of articles on this, that the thermoacoustic effect was definitely the effect producing that. And there's even a patent from 1992 showing how you can um, actually encode voice through this microwave auditory effect, uh, even for uh, uh, deaf people. So th this is something that could be used as a... Uh, uh, as, as a prosthesis, potentially, although I'm not sure I would advocate microwaving somebody's head. Depends on the exposure. But this concept is very interesting. A uh, couple other things, definitely relevant. I always consider this kind of a landmark paper. You won't usually see it referenced in the photoacoustic field. Um, 1979, they first demonstrated the photoacoustic microscope and basically just had a microphone and something like a laser pointer, but it was the same kind of intensity, and they just uh, uh, modulated it with a chopper and detected the sound and scanned it, and this is a saw transducer, a uh, first photoacoustic image that I'm aware of uh, in the field. So that was kind of a landmark. Um, one other thing, anybody that knows Theodore uh, Bowen, um, he has a very famous patent in the field related to thermoacoustic imaging and in this entire field of thermoacoustic and photoacoustic imaging. He was in, the, of course, the physics department here uh, at the U of A at the time and uh, just actually just recently passed away this year, earlier this year. Um, but he was, in, he was also interested in these acoustic emissions from neutrinos at, at the bottom of the ocean, if you can believe that. That was one of his research areas. But he, he submitted this patent and it actually, in some ways, locked up the field because it was in early 2000 when this patent ran out. 
when you started to see the explosion of photoacoustic imaging in general in the medical field, which I'll get into. So what are we looking at with photoacoustic imaging and spectroscopy? The principle is relatively simple. You've got a pulse of energy. It could be microwaves. It could be laser, uh, any wavelength. There's even particles. Um, small amount of heating, whatever absorbs that energy. So that's going to be specific to wavelength, of course. Uh, you get a small amount of thermoelastic expansion from a, a temperature change for imaging, which might be on the order of uh, a millikelvin. That's usually enough to generate an image um, and with safe exposure. And then that launches an acoustic wave that you detect with conventional or unconventional uh, ultrasound receivers. The typical pulses that are used are somewhere on the order of 5 nanoseconds because that allows you to get about 100 megahertz of bandwidth with your acoustic emissions. You want that for your ultrasound resolution um, to be able to have good resolution. Okay. And the contrast is primarily related to optical absorption. There are other terms, but generally we think this is the dominant uh, source of contrast in the images. Um, get good penetration. You can even do volume imaging with a single pulse of light if you have uh, an array of ultrasound receivers to do that. And you can even do, depending on the scenario, you could go two centimeters, maybe a little bit more. And I'm putting here this high spatial resolution. So from two microns to 300 microns, and that depends on the scenario. If, you ha if you're working from a diffraction limit, you can get down to two microns and even go beyond what you could typically do with, in terms of penetration with confocal or two photon because the light only has to go one way and the sound comes back. So you can get a little bit extra penetration, but you still are kind of limited to the optical diffraction. If you get away from the diffraction limit, then your resolution is on the order of ultrasound but, or it could be anywhere in between here. And I'll uh, just show what that means in a second. And then if you're working with uh, contrast agents in terms of nanomolarity for a dye, for example, you can get down to nanomolar. Not quite as good as fluorescent imaging, much better than MRI. Uh, not as good as, as SPECT, um, but there are people trying to improve even beyond that because this is still okay uh, for some in vivo applications. Uh, and, and in terms of endogenous contrast, if we look at light and the spectrum, uh, without any contrast agents or anything, these are the kind of things that will typically light up. And I'm showing the near infrared window. Of course, you could do this at visible light. You're probably not going to get the light much more than a few millimeters at visible, maybe five millimeters. So most people, most applications, you're working with near-infrared light. So what do we tend to look at? Well, blood oxygen, which is uh, blood oxygen in the red, oxygenated blood, versus deoxygenated blood, has very different absorption curves. So you can look at blood oxygen saturation with photoacoustic imaging and actually do functional imaging. Uh, even functional brain imaging based on this principle where you have at least two wavelengths and you can separate them. Um, lipid, it's, you know, if you have bulk li lipid, you have a peak around 900. Um, water starts to rise around 925 and has peaks above that. So this isn't a restricted range. I'm just kind of showing you examples of where most people are uh, applying the photoacoustic imaging. And then microwaves can, don't uh, scatter as much as light, but they actually absorb much more. The, the tissue absorbs microwaves, especially between 1 and 10 gigahertz. Um, you're mainly looking at contrast related to fat, water-based tissue, and fat-based tissue. That's where your big contrast is. Tumors tend to have more water, especially in the breast, compared to the surrounding tissue. So that would be a contrast enhancement. So I'm not going to talk too much about microwaves because Professor Hao Chin will be presenting October 29th, and we collaborate quite a bit um, on the thermoacoustic stuff. So I'm, I've kind of like tried to hang low on the, on the microwave stuff as much as possible so he can present all the cool stuff that we, we're doing. Um, <clears throat> so this is kind of what our system, we have tunable. These are two tunable uh, laser systems where we can tune from 410 nanometers to you know, even two microns. We can do photoacoustic and regular ultrasound even simultaneously or interleave them. This is showing the grayscale pulse echo. This is a mouse cecum um, from a while ago, but you can see this is a three-dimensional image showing ultrasound and photoacoustic. The photoacoustic is giving contrast related to the blood, and the ultrasound is giving you a contrast related to the density uh, uh, primarily the density of the cecum. So you see how you can get complementary information there. Okay. So I've actually applied photoacoustic imaging in a lot of different areas. So these are a few examples, and these are applications you can find in the literature. 
uh, for each of them. Uh, certainly not exhaustive, but you kind of get an idea of the kind of things you could do. Uh, functional brain imaging, do whisker stimulation, and you can see the change in the blood vessels uh, through the skull, through the skin. Um, demonstrated in 2003, that was one of the, actually the first things that came out from this field. Although it's, you, you don't see this widespread, but it at least shows the capability um, in terms of the technology. Hard applications, uh, having intravascular ultrasound devices, which are clinical devices, and then adding uh, something you insert through an artery into the heart for imaging. If you added photoacoustic onto that, you would get completely different contrasts, and there are groups. Uh, I'm thinking Rochester's working on it. I know they're working on a device for the prostate, the University of Rochester. Um, but there are several groups trying to develop a small enough device because uh, it's not quite small enough, but they're getting very close that you could actually sit, some, um, insert into a human. And then uh, certainly cancer applications. And this is uh, a slide from uh, quite a while ago uh, from Dan Bauer, graduated from Optical Sciences uh, in 2012. Uh, and simply shows a fluorescent image on Argemetro's microscope of GFP cells. These are prostate cancer cells that have been tagged with green fluorescent protein. So that's what you know, they would typically use to not say, hey, there's the tumor because they have this green fluorescent protein in them. This is a mouse window chamber that's uh, implanted uh, in different places on the dorsal flap on the back. Um, and we, we built a photoacoustic imaging system to allow us to see not only different contrasts, but deeper into the flap because it's not really thin, especially if you go a few, a couple weeks into this, it starts to thicken out as the tumor grows. Um, but I am still showing the top view to kind of see what kind of contrast you can get in the ultrasound. They all give you different information. So there's a paper in Science 2012, Photoacoustic Tomography in Vivo Imaging from Organelles to Organs. And there's all these different acronyms here, but the idea here is that uh, photoacoustic can have dramatic scales from two micron resolution uh, and uh, you know limited depth penetration. Even, but you can do this through a mouse skull because the skull's transparent to uh, the, the near infrared. To uh, up, upwards of you know penetrate more than a couple centimeters. Although I think that's usually the limit, except in some rare situations. It's about two centimeters. And the reason that it scales is because you can have different scenarios. This is uh, a photoacoustic microscope to give you a diffraction limited uh, spot right near the surface. Um, and, and there are different scenarios depending on if you're using the light to uh, focus down to provide the resolution versus using the ultrasound to do the imaging and, and resolving the uh, structures. Of course, the ultrasound can uh, then the light, if, the, if you have broad illumination, you can get that further than a millimeter because all you're doing is heating, and the ultrasound then does the imaging. So that's why there are these different scales um, going from very fine resolution outwards, depending on the application. And this is uh, a device, an uh, interventional device that Li Hong Wang, one of the pioneers in the field, uh, created. Um, it was used to look at inside the intestine of a rabbit. Um, of course, like, as I mentioned before, they're trying to develop small enough devices where they could use this in a, in a human and actually um, piggyback on existing endoscopes and be able to add this, so uh, make it easier to do that. So this is kind of a hot area, is simply finding where can they, how can this can be translated into a practical system, not only from a technological standpoint, from, but also from an economical standpoint, because um, that's often a bigger barrier than the technology. Um, there is this whole field of smart photoacoustic contrast agents, uh, and this gets into nanotechnology and doing targeted imaging, molecular imaging, combining these nanoparticles with cancer therapy. Uh, gold nanorods, for example, you hit them at, uh, in the near infrared, and they heat up incredi uh, with incredible temperatures to treat even a tumor. But they're also good for photoacoustic imaging because they absorb light at those same wavelengths. So this is simply a popular agent. However, you can't really use these in a human because they haven't really been shown to be safe. The only exception to using these kind of particles is if they're being used for therapy. Um, so Rice University has used gold nanoparticles for uh, gliomas and aggressive types of tumors. And in rare cases, you can then piggyback imaging onto, with the therapy if, if that'll work and get some information, but normally uh, most of these things are, are not approved. There's, in fact, there's a, a short list of approved dyes in particular 
um, and, and nanoparticles that are available. Um, so in vivo, this is an, an example that we did for in a prostate tumor where you can inject these gold nanorods. So before the injection, uh, we have different wavelengths here going from 680 to 900. And then after the injection, you can see the sustained larger signal from 680 to 900 due to the nanoparticles uh, being present. And it roughly matches the absorption, but the particles themselves can change their properties a little bit depending on whether they go inside a cell, whether they congregate. Um, but generally, they will be at the near-infrared, at least the nanorods are, when you inject them. And we also can do unmixing. So one of the nice, cool things about photoacoustic imaging with spectroscopy is that you can introduce multiple agents at the same time. And why would you want to do that? Well, uh, for molecular imaging, say you wanted to see what type of cell receptor was present on that tumor, but you're also interested in another cell receptor, and you wanted to image those at the same time. Well, you can introduce both intravenously or some other uh, method and unmix them by sweeping your, ultra, uh, your uh, optical wavelengths and then just using a linear algorithm to reconstruct uh, which, uh, which particles are where. And so here's an example in a mouse with the gold nanorods at 750 versus the gold nanorods that peak at 810. And it's very easy for a chemist to control the peak absorption because it depends on the aspect ratio uh, of the gold nanorods. And there's a really nice formula that they have all that figured out. Um, and this is another example where you have the blood contribution. Um, this is visible wavelengths. And then we introduced Alexa Flor dye and did the separation. And this is kind of what we got, uh, in this case, a prostate tumor model. Second. Okay, so uh, another area that we're interested in is how, how can we translate this technology to make it more widespread because you, you really don't see this being used even though it's been around certainly more than 10 years as technology. We are seeing commercial systems for mice. This is one of them, Visual Sonics. Ithera in Europe is another big one, um, mainly for mice. They're both dabbling in some human applications, just little human studies, but for the most part, you're not seeing this being picked up uh, dramatically. And so one of, one of the things that we think is important is that the technology needs to be portable and uh, translational and kind of low cost. The, these systems are, the photoacoustic system for Visual Sonics and Ithera are really over half a million dollars. Okay, And I don't think you'll see dedic dedicated systems like this spread across all hospitals uh, in the world based on the, there is a limited application because you get really got to be within two centimeters for everything you're doing. So there's just a few niche markets where this could be useful. So, um, but it hasn't always been that way. So in this case, they, had a, they did a clinical trial. They had a custom room, a custom ultrasound array, a custom laser. Um, this is, was for breast imaging, and they hit the entire breast with a couple of powerful um, uh, lasers at 780. Uh, yeah, Alexandrite laser, so 760. Um, and they're able to make these photoacoustic images. Of course, no contrast agents. You really can't do that at this point uh, for most of the applications. But you're seeing blood vessels, and you're seeing blood vessels near a lesion, and that's that makes you think that maybe there's a tumor there related to angiogenesis or the growth of new blood vessels. So they were making a case where this would improve your decision to biopsy to go in there and and uh, take a biopsy. So there, I think there's a lot of questions whether how dramatic that would change the person who sees a lesion, whether they're going to biopsy or not, because you're talking about, you know, whether the person has cancer or not. If there's something suspicious, you're likely to biopsy these days anyway. But it does kind of show how it could contribute. But the big problem here is that this, is a, this would be an expensive type of an arrangement, and you have a special room and to take the patient and to do this. Um, what we think is more practical if we can take an existing clinical scanner and even a linear array and make it, compatible for photoacoustic imaging. This is one of the big problems, and this is how most people approach the problem. So they have a linear array, and how do you deliver the light? We need acoustic coupling, so the probe is usually right up against the skin. How do you get the light where you want it? The, the, the ultrasound probe is looking at a plane right through here, and the light's coming from the side, which creates a kind of Certainly not an optimal uh, arrangement of how you want, want to do it. It's, ineff it's inefficient with the light, and the light is not in the field of view the entire way. So uh, Leo Mantia, 
uh, who graduated in 2013, came up with this design. A couple of key elements here, uh, and this looks kind of like kind of complicated, but the most important piece here is actually a glass slide right here. Okay. And the glass slide is great because it's transparent to the light, so that's not a problem, but it's a perfect acoustic reflector. So by total internal reflection, we get all the acoustic waves coming back to the transducer. Now, this is a water-filled compartment um, for the acoustic coupling. That We have what's called a tegaderm thin film that touches the skin or the object or whatever you're imaging for the interface. So there's coupling here at the edge. The big difference, you know, for regular ultrasound imaging is now the probe is perpendicular to how you would normally hold it. So a radiologist wouldn't like that. You know, we have ideas of how to correct that. You know, so certainly looking for partners in optical sciences to help uh, solve this solution to make this more upright rather than a perpendicular um, design like this. But you can see what the concept is. So we bring in a line illumination that hits the skin, and that line happens to be, would ideally be in the same plane that the ultrasound probe is imaging. And that's important because we want to be as efficient as possible with the light that's hitting the skin. We have a maximum limit according to safety, of how much fluence light that could be hitting the skin, which is typically, depends on the wavelength, 20 millijoules per centimeter squared. So whatever light we hit, we want it to be right where we're imaging. That's uh, part of the, the reason that we want this. The other nice thing is we could build this adapter for almost any linear array on the market out there. So a clinical system, you've got a linear array, we can do that. We've done it for a couple probes. Um, but... Uh, that's a nice little feature. So suddenly a system that is a regular ultrasound, you add a light source, you add this adapter, which we, was what we call it, um, and now we can do ultrasound and photoacoustic imaging. So this is what it looks like realized, SolidWorks. This is, has a cylindrical lens and the, the device. Um, and this is with just regular ultrasound imaging, which you could do together. And this is an image of a, a human pancreatic tumor in a mouse uh, use, using this adapter and two planes. So this is a 3D data set. Actually, this was a 4D data set because we had many wavelengths. But it gives you an idea here that the hot scale is your photoacoustic image related to the blood vessels primarily. And the, again, the gray is related to the density. So is there an improvement in terms of sensitivity? Well, if we use the standard fiber bundles, we got uh, this much signal relative to if we used the adapter. Uh, looking at the same structure. And this isn't scattering media, so that's why it falls off quickly. Um, so it kind of, uh, it, was, it, went, it went well in terms of um, the performance and what we were trying to do. And we tend to use that when we can for the experiments because it makes it a lot easier just to plug in a multi-mode fiber and the adapter on our probe and take it off if we need it and, and do other things. So this is kind of one vision. Uh, if you could do molecular imaging of the breast, to do diagnostics, prognostics, to follow a therapy and have a handheld system with a portable light source. The, the ultrasound scanner is pretty much portable. I can move that around. The light source right now is not. Uh, you saw them on the bench top. Uh, so that's why uh, I contacted Professor Q. And we've been uh, discussing different options to make the, our system more portable, and we think that uh, this would be, will be appealing to uh, some of the ultrasound companies. So Zanari Medical Systems uh, has licensed this, la well, a couple years ago. The patent was issued last year, this device. And so we would like to go back to them and say, we've got a portable system now. Let's, let's work with either people doing the imaging here or with the company to develop a prototype. Um, let me just, okay, it's 423. Okay. Uh, timing is good. All right, so I just want to mention that w we are interested and have developed to some extent the, this concept of uh, novel photoacoustic detector arrays to allow you to rapidly image. Remember I mentioned that y it's conceivable with one light pulse you could do volumetric imaging. Uh, with piezoelectric ultrasound transducers, there are not, there certainly are no standard 3D probes. The only exception might be for cardiac imaging, um, and it's a niche thing for, for looking at the heart you know, on a clinical system. Um, it's difficult to pack piezoelectric devices with the channels and, and, 
um, and it's an exp expensive process, especially depending on the frequency. So people have looked at different options. These are MEMS-based capacitive micro-machined ultrasound transducers originally came from Stanford in 1992 or so. And uh, we, we've done a few little things with those and have uh, actually a, a, a device that can connect to my Zanari ultrasound scanner, the clinical scanner, and collect images 3D. Um, I haven't done too much more with it other than to say, hey, we, we can use this, still looking for, you know, either help or the right project to develop that further. Um, you can use optical devices where there's no discrete point where you're detecting, it depends on your optical detection and how you're scanning your, your light along that surface. And this is a lobster nerve cord back that we, we worked at in Michigan, a cross section. And this is high resolution. So another thing, piezoelectric transducer is very difficult to do high frequency, high resolution imaging because once you get higher than 20 to 30 megahertz, very difficult to cut the crystal and, and do it in the right way. And the only company that I know of that can that does do a good job, and they have some patented laser cutting technology, is Visual Sonics. Um, and we, we have some transducers with the mouse imaging system, which is actually a core system. Uh, but very few examples where you get really uh, arrays of high-resolution piezoelectric uh, receivers. Um, so Edelon's, this is probably has 100 megahertz bandwidth compared to, you know, typically 20 or 30 megahertz for piezoelectric. Um, and this is something that we developed uh, a few years ago and just patented, uh, got the patent was issued last year, and Bob Norwood helped uh, making acoustoelectric MEMS, and I'll talk about the acoustoelectric effect in a second. But basically, uh, it allows, this is an example of doing photoacoustic imaging, or at least we were detection, uh, with a device that had multiple acoustoelectric um, detectors. And uh, the, the interesting thing about this one is that the array here is almost completely transparent. It's on a slide. There's a few discrete points that are, that are dark. But um, wouldn't it be nice to deliver light through your detector and then deliver the sound coming back? Uh, we tried a little bit with this, never got too far um, partnering with another group. Um, this one, uh, you can do that at certain wavelengths with the gold film. So anyway, still, you know, certainly if there are anybody out there or you think there's a person that would be interested in this that are not here, let me know because these are things that could develop into a project based on where we are. And this is really the only slide that might overlap with how Jen is talking about October 29th, and I figure he hasn't already finished his talk because you've got a few weeks. But uh, I just want to mention, you know, we just came back from Atlantic City a couple weeks ago. We were testing these explosives underground, trying to do non-contact thermoacoustic imaging with microwaves. And the, the principle is based on, uh, well, 94 gigahertz vibrometry, which was the most appealing to DARPA, and trying to detect displacements at the surface. So now we have a standoff. There's no acoustic coupling. There's no water. Uh, you can see with the laser, we're many centimeters away from the surface of this. We're just probing the surface. When we generate sound from the structures inside, and in this case, we're hitting it with a microwave pulse, though, after a, a time delay, those, the sound waves reach the surface and create a displacement at the surface. So we can detect that with laser vibrometry, which can look down to about a picometer, uh, on the picometer scale for displacements. Um, the 94 gigahertz vibrometer, which is much longer wavelength, uh, turns out we're getting down to maybe around a couple hundred picometers, which I don't think anybody has gotten that low with a microwave vibrometer, you know, at least in this style. And this is simply a sample image. We had two Rexolite disks embedded in a gel. We scanned it with the, det with the detector. This is actually with the laser. And we can see what was underneath, so completely non-contact. So I think lots of possible applications for medical imaging. There have been other people that have worked with laser vibrometers a little bit for this purpose. So there is some overlap. But still, I think it could be an area that would be interesting. All right. So the, the last few minutes is the last technique that I haven't mentioned. Um, and that's uh, the acoustoelectric effect. So we've used uh, sound to shake things up. We've used light to shake things up. Now, now we're going to go back. We're going to shake things up with sound, but instead of shaking up the tissue, well, we are shaking up the tissue, but we're interested in shaking up the electricity also. And the reason that we can do that is because ultrasound, turns out, modulates tissue resistivity. And this goes back, you know, more than 100 years, this was kind of recognized. It was first demonstrated in 1945 by a guy named Fox and with colloids in solution, and he measured this voltage change. Um, and 
Uh, but this is the basic, the simplest I could make it for you. You got a pressure differential in tissue or a material. You have an interaction constant, which is specific to material. And that uh, is, changes the re electric resistivity of the material as that ultrasound pulse is propagating. Okay. Quite simple, but resistivity is, a, is just is a passive property. You, know, you can't measure that unless you do something else. Okay. So I'll get back to, let me see what my next slide was. So how can we exploit this mechanism to image current source densities? Well, there's two parts. There's this equation that I just mentioned. And then we also need Ohm's law. Okay, So if we've got current flowing through the tissue and we're modulating the resistivity, we're going to generate a voltage modulation. So V equals IR, you're modulating R. Now you've got the current flowing, and that could come from two electrodes for impedance, which I'm not going to talk about, um, but that's possible. Or the current could come from a bioelectric current, like from the heart or the brain or muscle. Okay? And that's what we want to focus on. That, that's the, the coolest and most interesting aspect of this. Okay? So uh, interaction. So what's happening here is you have a carrier frequency that is the ultrasound. It's going to be... Uh, it's going to modulate the current that's flowing, and you're going to detect that modulation, which is around megahertz, because that's the ultrasound frequency, on two or more electrodes. Okay. So if you detect that interaction signal, which is sometimes difficult, you know exactly where it's coming from because it has to be at the focal spot of the ultrasound. It's not, there's no other interference. So if you just had two electrodes, you would have no idea where the potential difference was. It could be anywhere in the tissue. Now you have a signature that is specific to the ultrasound transducer and the focal spot to resolve the, elect the spatial measurement of the electrical current that's flowing. That's the principle that we wanted to take advantage of. And we originally worked on this uh, in Michigan, and you know, I've continued this here, this concept. I should have played that earlier. One more time. Okay. I want to just show the general equation. This is this, hopefully this is familiar to a lot of you, at least mostly. This is uh, your, your current, you know, how, how to relate V to J, your current source density equation. I've added another term now because now I'm saying the ultrasound beam is affecting this potential that you're measuring. So this, there's this whole extra term that's related to the ultrasound beam, uh, the amplitude, the frequency, what, what, whatever, what have you. Um, and these are the traditional terms that you would normally have if you didn't have the ultrasound. Okay, so we can now modulate this voltage that we're detecting. Um, this signal that we're detecting here will have both the traditional electrical measurement. That might be your ECG, it might be your EEG, whatever it is. That's the low frequency. That's your kilohertz or below bioelectric current. And you'll also have this megahertz signal that's being encoded onto that uh, by the ultrasound beam, which is what we're mainly interested in, although we would typically record both. We just split them and filter. Um, and, um, and this is uh, just an example of a waveform that we would detect at the right time, which is converted to space by speed of sound, just like with ultrasound. But now I want to make it clear. We're talking about the one-way travel of the speed of sound to the target, and we're detecting the signal on electrodes. Okay, so a little bit different than what I've showed before. The information is coming on these electrodes, and the ultrasound is just the transmitting and interacting with the tissue. And you can see that V, this voltage, is proportional to J and the current in the tissue. Okay, so what's the advantage of doing this? Well, potentially could do 4D imaging of current densities, the fourth dimension being time, and scan a volume with the ultrasound. You can do volumetric um, imaging. You got a spatial resolution that's determined by the ultrasound focus. We tend to be on the right side of this for, I'll explain why in a second, but on the order of a millimeter. Um, and co-registration, we can do regular anatomical or structural imaging with pulse echo. Of course, that acoustic wave that we're sending is also scattering back, which we can detect on the ultrasound probe also. So we can do that simultaneously. And there's this trade-off between resolution sensitivity, scan area, frame rate, how fast we can do it, how large of an area. Um, the big challenge that we, we are trying to deal with um, in different ways is this tiny interaction signal when you're talking about biocurrents and biological tissue. But I'll give you some good news at least that we can detect something. Okay. 
So why would we? Why do we map biopotentials in the body? So uh, electrical mapping is most common during treatment for arrhythmias and epilepsy. So just a few from what's typically used today, or some you know little wrinkles that we put in there. But brain mapping for epilepsy during surgery, for example. Of course, if we could do this through the skull, that would be amazing, also. And then intracardiac uh, mapping before you ablate tissue in the heart. Uh, typically related to an arrhythmia or irregular heartbeat. Um, these are done 100,000 procedures a year, um, each of these, something like that. So very common. Uh, and these are just two examples of how you might uh, do electrical mapping in the body. Um, and typically done with a large array of electrodes, and you move it around and you reconstruct uh, in case of the heart. And then mapping can be time-consuming, inaccurate, and prone to registration errors. And this is really well known. When they're doing this ablation procedure, they often have to do it. Um, there's a two-hour mapping procedure, first of all. It takes two hours. You've got to move the electrode in and out and reconstruct and try to figure out where the arrhythmia is. And then, then they start doing the ablation. They'll typically miss two, three, four, five times before they hit the right spot. And that's, that's just standard. So um, not, not the, the, if you looked at the system, it's like, whoa, this is incredible, amazing, you know, all the movies. But the registration is an issue over two hours, and um, that might be part of it. So um, we, we do think there's at least an application when you've got electrodes right in the heart where we think our sensitivity would be best. But if we could back out and do it completely non-invasively, of course, that would even have much wider application. So I just wanted to give you an example of how we do. I, I take a very simple one from a long time ago. We got electrodes. We just put a, a ring of electrodes in the bath here like this. We create a dipole with electrodes so we can control it. We sweep the ultrasound. This is a thin bath in this case. Um, and we sweep the electrodes around. And if I just look at one lead, what the image looks like. So now I've swept the ultrasound in this bath back and forth. Um, and I'm now just showing what the image looks like across one lead, the AE, ampli the amplitude of the signal. There's phase, so there's directional information. Um, we can almost completely reconstruct the entire volume where this dipole is from just one lead. Of course, you could never do that without the ultrasound. You wouldn't know where it was inside the circle. Okay, so that's interesting. So if you actually do all the math and you do the reconstruction, we can make an image like that. If you use the conventional reconstruction, you might get like a probability of where the dipole is located, something like that. And these are just, you know, the boundary rules. So it kind of gives you an idea, a very simple example, because I'm going to get a little bit more complicated for a few slides. Because now I'm going to throw in, instead of a bath with thin saline, I'm going to give you a heart that is beating. Yeah, it looks like it's just the heart sitting there, but it's beating. I'll show you in the next slide. Um, this is called a Langendorf preparation. So you can have an isolated heart. You can have it for even a few hours with a heart just sitting there beating. That's great. Um, we, we, kind of modified, we kind of modified this. So we have the heart in a special chamber with a film. The ultrasound's coming from below, focused the, 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 the transducers in a water tank. Um, we can send coded pulses or square pulses, whatever, for the acoustoelectric. We're using an intracardiac catheter, a Biosense Webster 20 electrodes. We just set it on the surface of the heart um, and then do signal conditioning to try to do acoustoelectric detection and imaging. And just so, oops, I'll look here. Just so this will show you that it's alive. Okay, so that's what that looks like. How do we do imaging, though, over time and space? And that's what I'm trying to show you on this slide. This is a timing diagram. Uh, this is your normal ECG signal, which we can measure. So we stimulate the heart um, to generate a contraction, but there's a time delay as it goes through the delay circuits of the heart, um, and you actually get the ECG signal. In the meantime, we're pulsing the ultrasound as fast as we can, and we're monitoring this AE signal. When that pulse the f reaches a point where there's current flowing through, now we see this modulation signal show up. Okay, so that, that's the idea. Okay, so um, so we can simultaneously record this ECG AE and pulse echo while pacing, and then then we can also scan the ultrasound beam for volumetric imaging, you know, even 4D uh, data set. Um, but it is a mechanical scan. We're using one transducer. We're not using an array right now. We're working on building something a little bit faster. Um, but the other key thing is, even though I show you this beating, usually we use a chemical to keep it from moving like that. Because if we try to scan something, 
uh, with it bouncing around, and if it took a few minutes, you know, it might probably wouldn't be in the same spot. So there's a chemical that'll deactivate the mechanical but keep the electrical active. That's called a BDM and has a fancy name that's used in during cardiac surgery. Um, so just so you know that. All right, just a, a few examples. So here we scan the ultrasound in a line. Okay, and so we're looking in depth. Remember the ultrasound transducers underneath, we scan in a line, and we can see at the right time, this is the ECG waveform, so if you follow it. So right at the arrival of the ECG, we start to see activity, uh, direction and amplitude encoded by the AE signal. Um, and the depth happens to be, this is the distance from the transducer, so it turns out the RV wall, which is what you're looking at, is located right around the 60 millimeter mark. So we're seeing the current at that position across the lead that we happen to be recording from uh, passing through the cardiac wall in terms of an image, uh, what we call B-mode, a color B-mode image is what we call it. Just, just to show that it is possible to do a four-dimensional, um, I'm actually showing now three slices through the wall, so this is kind of a volume and then it's over time, so, um, so it is possible to do this. This takes a little while to scan and, and do it, but just to show that it's possible and detect it and reconstruct. And the only other one for the heart I'm gonna show you is, we did one experiment where we did before and after ablation. So we use just a cold applicator and we push it on the heart and uh, cryoablation it's called. And here's the, what happened to the ECG and I'm just showing one lead. Um, this is your standard lead for the ECG. So something happened here. We don't know what happened, but something happened. And the image kind of gives you a better idea of where the current's flowing and how it changed without analyzing it anymore. You can still see uh, the difference. Okay. So some different applications. Okay, so I want to emphasize um, this is sensitivity and resolution because this is a big deal. Um, we, we've done this at different frequencies. We typically do it at 0.5 megahertz, so you can kind of get an idea on the order of 3 millimeter resolution. If we increase to 1 megahertz, we can get, you know, double the, the resolution. But look at sensitivity. It drops off by a factor of eight. And if you think about it, we're doing a volume integration near the focus of the ultrasound spot. So as we double the frequency, the, the, that volume is really going down by a factor of eight. So um, there is this trade-off, and we, we have some ideas at least to dramatically improve this. And, uh, and, and uh, so that's kind of the current state in terms of wh where we are um, in the technology. So I just want to mention, can we do this in the brain? Take the same approach. There's lots of potential applications, right? I list them there. The good news is, so I, I just, or a few days ago, learned that I was awarded a planning grant, R24 NIH, which is a little bit interesting because we do experiments. There are experiments planned in animals. It's a three-year project, but there's also a lot of talking. So it, the idea is you have a, a really good team. You discuss different problems. You can go in different directions at any moment. Um, and this is the team, you know, University of Washington, Duke uh, consultants from there, uh, people at the U of A, Lars Fernlid, I think is the only other optical science person on here. Um, but this, that could be exciting because it's a different application. Huge challenges to try to do this, you know, through the skull. However, that, some of this has already been figured out. Even if we don't have a system to do it, we know we can focus an ultrasound beam with one millimeter resolution through the adult human skull. And PsychTech does that for therapy. There's a paper on it by uh, Cuervo Hinnanen, who's at Toronto, the pioneer in this field. Used to be at the U of A. Unfortunately, we lost them in around 1990. He went to Toronto. Um, but that part of it is possible. The question is, can we detect this interaction signal? Um, and that's going to be the greatest challenge. Uh, not, not that we're experts on delivering. I have uh, one expert on delivering ultrasound through the skull, but um, that'll be part of the challenge. And so, you know, I mentioned some of the people that's involved in some of this work, it's not all of them. Uh, this picture, which was, I think, from 2008, uh, everyone here was from optical sciences, uh, except Ragnar Olafsson, who was a postdoc that came from Michigan. Uh, all of them got PhDs, Pierre got a master's. Um, so that's an interesting picture, just in terms of how they contributed to this project. You can see some of the companies and some of the scientific collaborators. Uh, and, and I want to just highlight people in optical sciences that I've been closest with the last uh, few years, and Conq is a, a new person that I added. And 
This is just to be continued because I do have a part two to this, shaking up healthcare with frequency and vibration, which is more focusing on how to use these energies for therapy. So anyway, you have to invite me back for that, though. So. Thanks. Well, yeah. With that, I'll open up the floor for questions. If the audience has any questions.